Sydney. We're going to get going. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, the title, uh, as you have no doubt seen in your programs, is Tech Versus Journalism, Who's in Control? So before we get started, I want to get one thing uh, settled right from the get-go. So if you're in, you know, just to let get this done, you know, because then you might just, if you're looking for the answer to that question, we're going to tell it to you right now in case you want to go to another panel. <laughs> um, because if you expected this to really be a discussion about tech versus journalism, you're going to be disappointed. Because uh, if it's a battle, that battle is over. And uh, the clear winner is tech. Let's just be completely clear. Technology is in control. If you leave here with only one message, let it be that. We'll see if my, our panelists agree with me. Um, so I'll talk about more, more in a second, but I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vivian Schiller, and um, I, am an, uh, I have a long career in journalism working for organizations such as CNN, The New York Times, NPR, NBC News. Um, I was also with Twitter, so I have seen um, the future of tech and control very up, up close and personal. <laughs> And I'm, concern, I'm currently an advisor to a number of different companies all over the world, and I'm here under the auspices of one of uh, the companies that I'm advising. It's called Vocative, very interesting um, company doing very interesting projects, and if I get a chance, I'll weave it, uh, a little bit of that into, the, into this conversation as well. Um, before I introduce the players, I just want to sort of elaborate on my thesis statement, which is to say um, the reason tech is in control, first of all, many legacy, legacy by which I mean newspapers, companies that started as newspapers, television and radio, don't really understand technology. Now, that's not true of all, but many don't. Um, many are being outmaneuvered by the pure play news organizations who understand that tech is not only central to their reporting, but uh, even maybe perhaps more important central to the ways that they reach and engage with audiences. And all news organizations, whether they're pure plays or uh, legacy, um, are being completely outmaneuvered from a technology point of view by the tech companies. And by that, I mean the platforms such as Twitter, Instagram, you know, Periscope, Meerkat, Snapchat, and of course, most of all, Facebook. Um, they are, even though they will uh, deny saying it, they are turning into news organizations. They are delivering news information to mass audiences, much of it filtered by an algorithm created by an engineer whose primary motivation has nothing to do with the primary motivation of most of us in this room. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Emily Bell, who has no doubt been to the Perugia Journalism Festival uh, many times. If there is a free press, then journalists are no longer in charge of it. So to reframe this panel, it is about tech. It is not about tech versus journalism. It is about technology in support of journalism or to steal a line, sorry Dan, from one of our panelists, if you're doing journalism, you're doing tech. That was a good line, so I'm gonna use that, but with <laughs> attribution, because I am a good journalist. So you can leave now. You can leave now, yeah. <laughs> so what we're gonna talk about is how do you set up your newsroom, how do you think about your organi organizational structure, who do you hire, what about those pesky cultural issues, and what about the platforms? We have a very esteemed uh, group of individuals uh, who some might call unicorns, if you were in the session yesterday, um, all of whom are unicorns, and, um, and uh, who are all at the center of, of, of technology um, in the service of reporting, displaying, disseminating, and discussing the most important stories of the day. So uh, starting from to my immediate left is Greg Barber. Is, he's the director of the Digital News Project at the Washington Post, focusing on online community building, user-generated contributions, social media, personalization and aggregation, and much else. Um, he was, prior to that, managing editor of uh, WAPO Labs, now called Trove, separate company, where he hired and led an international team of editors, um, launching Trove.com and the Washington Post uh, social reader. Uh, next to Greg is Jackie Mayer, who's an interactive journalist with the BBC, working with News Labs and the rest of BBC News to find the best ways of producing and presenting stories across different media. Prior to the BBC, Jackie was at the New York Times where she spent several years on the inter interactive news desk and also um, New York Times R&D labs. Uh, next up, Raju Narasetti is Senior Vice President and Deputy Head of Strategy for News Corp, 
where he guides both new digital products and digital growth of the existing News Corp properties. He's previously served as deputy managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, managing editor of Wall Street Journal Digital Network, managing editor of, of Washington Post uh, Company, and prior to joining the Post, he served as the founding editor of one of the most interesting products of its day and, and, and today, um, which is India's Mint. And um, last but certainly not least is Dan Gilmore. Um, Dan teaches digital media literacy and entrepreneurship at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. He writes, uh, he is a, writes broadly um, for many publications on technology and media and speaks uh, far and wide on those topics. He's the author of several books about grassroots journalism and media literacy. His new project, I'm taking this from which we want, hope to hear more about because didn't ask you about that when I got a chance. Uh, tentatively entitled Permission Taken looks at the way governments and corporations are centralizing control over technology and communications and what we can do to reverse that trend. We may get into that as well. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, asking our, the panelists a few questions and um, I'm gonna bring in audience questions um, early and often to make this as interactive as possible. Greg, I'm gonna start with you. Um, so the Washington Post is using technology, utilizing technology in service of its journalism. But the interesting thing about the Post is, uh, the Washington Post is also developing technology as for standalone products, mm -hmm. as a core, as a standalone core competency with projects like Coral and others. So talk to us a little bit about how you think about those two, two efforts. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting and, and it's been an evolution over the, the past few years at the Post uh, going from uh, being, you know, uh, primarily thinking about technology just in service of journalism, and now thinking about technology sort of as a as a project in its own right. Um, you know, what we what we do with with um, a number of our, our projects, you know, uh, two of them that you mentioned, one of them being uh, the Coral Project, which is actually a, a partnership uh, between the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, Mozilla, uh, and it's funded by a, a grant from the Knight Foundation. Um, is an open source project um, with sort of kind of its, its own pathway, um, you know, looking to uh, improve user-generated content and uh, community across uh, all sorts of publisher websites. And there's a whole other panel that will be talking about that <laughs> tomorrow if you, uh, if you want to tune in. Uh, another one uh, that, that we're working on, which is an entirely internal post effort, um, is the, the Washington Post is, is building its own content management system, um, and we hope to bring that to market. Um, so that other publications could use it. Um, that is really sort of the, the most obvious, I think, uh, example of this movement from uh, newsrooms creating technology, you know, simply in service of themselves, um, and, uh, and instead kind of moving that technology further outward. Um, and really it just, it kind of came from, I guess sort of a similar place that Coral did, um, in that, you know, we saw that we had, uh, that other news organizations had the same kinds of needs that we did, um, that existing technology uh, built by folks who aren't journalists um, weren't, wasn't necessarily meeting all of the needs of journalists. Um, and uh, we saw an opportunity there to take the expertise that we developed um, over the years in technology and uh, turn that into a product. Do you, do you find that uh, building these products that you then um, release into the market, is a, does that cause any tension or distraction from technology in service of the journalism, the original reporting and original journalism for the Washington Post? Well, you know, the good thing about both of those examples is that they tackle head-on needs that we have within the newsroom. Uh, so they're priorities that we would have had anyway. Um, so really, yeah, no, there's not, there, there's not a lot of tension there because these, these, are, these would be high priority items that we would be tackling. Um, but instead, we're tackling them for, for ourselves and then also sort of uh, looking to, to take that work and uh, ap apply it to other people's needs. Raju, I'm going to go uh, to you next because um, a lot of what Greg is talking about, I think that you have a point of view about as well, and I've heard you talk about concerns for news organizations who are under such financial pressure as it is um, in terms of distribution and building audience and monetization, that the notion of building a core competency around technology may be in some cases a bridge too far. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, so I used to work at the Washington Post and Greg and I know each other for a long time, so I'll preface that by saying it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard for a news organization to want to build a CMS, right? It is not our core competency, has never been. Right? We've been good at l putting layers of interesting applications on top of um, CMSs. 
I can understand if it's a new startup digital company that is born out of this era where they have a core technology competence on which they're building a journalism competence. I think there is a significant confusion in a uh, lot of mainstream news organizations that the user engagement challenges, the challenge of building loyalty, the challenge of getting millennials to come and read and kind of consume our journalism can be solved if only we were a great tech company because they're seeing others with technology somehow succeed in that. And I think there are a lot of CTOs uh, who are kind of um, happy to kind of propagate that myth that if only we could build our own systems, if only we could have you know 100 more engineers, we will solve all of the journalism side problems. It helps that some organizations have very deep pocketed kind of investors who don't necessarily have to show results. Uh, Washington Post is a, certainly a recent example of that. And I think if that's the philosophy, sure, go ahead and do it. I personally am unsure, actually I'm very sure that it's not gonna solve our journalism challenges, especially challenges that are coming from the bus feeds and uh, you know, more nimble organizations. Um, there are just a lot of issues why uh, I believe that we, our core competency has never been technology. We can build it, but the idea that we will start from the scratch now in 2015 and not only catch up, but leapfrog others who rely on technology or whose core is technology is an interesting kind of a, a fallacy. That, that's true, but on the other hand, you have uh, coming up in the world of journalism, you mentioned BuzzFeed, some of the other pure plays, uh, Vox most, most notably, that come at the challenge of journalism very much from a technology and product point of view and are, and are quite successful. So yeah, how absolutely. do legacy news organizations compete? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think if your core structure and costs are very different, then you can have ambitions to kind of invest a lot in technology. And I still think that we should invest a lot in technology, but one simple example that I have run into when I was uh, in journalism, I'm not so anymore, is that most journalism organizations price their technology on version one. And the CTO will come and tell the CEO, I can build this for 200,000, why are we paying a million dollars or whatever, right? And everybody falls in love with that, they do it, they forget that if you are a true technology company, you need to have funding for version two, three, four, five, and six. Meanwhile, everybody else whose core competency is building a CMS are continuing to do that. And we've gone through these cycles, we've built our own commenting systems, we've gone outside because we realized that by the time five years go by, yours is running on Band-Aids while there's a, somebody out there building newer and newer versions. So I just worry about this notion that at a time when we are struggling in our core journalism enterprise for a variety of reasons, we are actually going to take resources and try to be something else. If, Go ahead. If, if I may. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I, I learned very early on not to disagree with Raju because he's almost always right. Uh, but, but in this case, I'll put a little asterisk next to the almost. Uh, because I, I, I think that, um, and, and Raju, by the way, was one of our most technology forward managing editors. So, uh, so I, I, I think that if he was still at the post, uh, he, might, he might have a different feeling about some of these things. But, um, but I think that, uh, I guess the notion is, isn't necessarily that you have to sacrifice the journalism in order to, to, to uh, move forward the technology. Um, my, my, uh, our editor in chief, Marty Barron, uh, gave a gave a speech uh, last week where he where he spoke about this quite a bit. So if if you don't mind, I'll crimp a bit from the boss. Um, one of the things that he said was that uh, that our goal last year, and I think that goal continues this year, um, is to continue transforming um, in the space of digital technology, but also uh, investing in our journalistic ambitions. So at the same time that we've been doing uh, things like you know. Uh, uh, um, embracing new approaches to technology and, and trying to uh, monetize some of that. Um, we also hired 100 journalists. Um, and so what we've done is, is doubled down sort of in, in both spaces. Um, and of course, as, as Raju pointed out, we, uh, we have ownership that is, uh, that is supportive of all of that, which, uh, for which I'm very grateful and I, and I know most of my colleagues are as well. Um, but you know, also I guess getting back to, to Vivian's point, uh, if, we, if we don't sort of evolve in this direction, um, I think that's the point at which technology really, uh, to borrow from there will be blood, drinks our milkshake. Um, and uh, so we, we, want to, we want to try to keep as much of that milkshake for ourselves as we can. 
I do not remember that line from The Real People. <laughs> I'm going to have to rewatch the movie. I want to come back to this uh, because this is a very interesting line of, uh, of conversation. And Raji, I'm going to come back to you a little bit later to talk about because I know you are not against technology in news organizations and you're living evidence of that. But I want to go on to our other um, panelists as well. So Jackie, you're uh, of all of the panelists, you are the only one who did not begin your career as a journalist but began your career as an engineer, as a technologist, um, as we heard for those of you that were in the panel yesterday, and now you're using those skills in, in the service of journalism. So um, talk to us a little bit about how you're approaching that collaboration from the technology side uh, in working with BBC journalists. Uh, sure. Um, you're right. I didn't start out as a journalist. Um, at the BBC, uh, the work I'm doing, uh, I, I come at it from uh, the standpoint of what, what would make for the best storytelling, um, not so much from how can we, how can we build uh, the best CMS necessarily. Um, if it, it depends um, on what we're trying to do. One of our, one of our current projects um, is a collaboration with BBC Africa. Um, we're telling a story about the drug trade in Guinea-Bissau. And one of the ways that uh, we were brainstorming how to tell it was by um, uh, commissioning a comic artist that we had worked with before. Um, and one of the problems uh, in the past when the BBC has done uh, this sort of comic, um, and by which I just mean the medium, not, not the tone, um, uh, rendering of a story is that uh, it doesn't really uh, scale out to render well on different devices. So someone trying to look on a smartphone would have more trouble because it, it would typically be using a slideshow template, let's say, or some other template that it would shoehorn a comic in. So here's a case where um, I was actually lucky enough to uh, have a friend named Michael Keller at Al Jazeera America who already went through the process of making a tool and open sourcing it for the precise purpose of re uh, rendering comics across devices. So most of that, that project has been, uh, from a tech standpoint, um, figuring out, um, doing a survey of the available tools, figuring out if we had to write something ourselves or not, um, with the end goal of best serving our audiences across all platforms. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, like sometimes you have to build something yourself, but sometimes uh, there's already something out there and, and just knowing how to integrate it is most important. Dan, l uh, let me come to you because I know your, your, passion, your passion on this area is, is not necessarily specific to the issues inside newsroom, but the issues that news organizations and uh, 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 creators of original journalistic content are facing in, in light of the fact that the platforms have become such a dominant form of distribution. And what that says about um, giving away your content, giving away your data, giving away your relationship with the audience. So talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, now it's on. Okay. If, <laughs> now can you hear me? Okay. If you're in German, if if you're doing journalism, you're doing technology. Period. That's just a fact. We we you, that's not a option anymore, and we shouldn't even worry about that. Uh, my concern in all this, and I'm going to, I am going to personally steer a little clear of the newsroom issues. I I, I haven't been part of a newsroom for a long time, and I think it would be uh, stupid for me to try and solve that. But what I do think is enormously concerning is the fact that in a world that tech is so dominant, uh, there are facts, uh, facts on the ground and things happening that are causing a re-centralization of a medium that was born on the uh, incredible promise of radical decentralization of the internet and personal tools that would attach to it. Rapidly becoming re-centralized by uh, governments through a number of things uh, like surveillance and uh, which is more directly controlling than many people seem to think, corporations and others. And, and by the way, we are implicated in this because we have been collectively choosing convenience over liberty and we've done that for some years now and uh, so we're getting the results of that. Uh, 
I will, by the way, tomorrow when I talk a bit about why I think journalists should be activists, this will be part of it. The centralizing powers include, and not the only ones, but the telecoms, I think, are at the top of the list. They are not just, uh, if we're going to use a print analogy here, they are not just the printing presses, uh, but they're the, uh, the trucks used to deliver the product. Then there are very few of them. And most of them are tied quite directly to governments, especially in the developing word, world and uh, major countries like China and Russia. Well, I should add the U.S. to that, not quite as uh, direct a tie, but they're clearly connected. So that's one aspect of centralization that journalists really should be facing and uh, understanding that this constrains our ability to do our work or certainly has that potential. The other platform, uh, the other major centralization that I'll talk about right now is the platforms that Vivian mentioned at the beginning. And they include and are not limited to uh, Twitter and Google, Google f more from the search side than the content side, and the uh, you know, billion pound elephant Facebook, which is where people are, and journalists quite logically want to go where people are, but I think quite illogically are uh, giving away a lot of what they do to the companies that, if not now, are uh, chief competitors are going to be very soon. And Facebook is at the top of that list. Uh, it, it's extraordinarily weird to me that people, for example, give their comments to Facebook. Uh, I don't understand that. That seems uh, short-sighted as an understatement. So what we have with all of this is something really unprecedented, which is uh, a concentration of power and control in these choke points that has never existed before. The, the media concentration we used to worry about, at least in America, is nothing compared to what's going on uh, in this area. And uh, the, the question is, well, what do we do about that in the end? And it's going to take a long time, but I, I would just say to my journal, journalism friends, reminding us all that the first rule when you're in, in you know, when you've dug yourself into a hole is you stop digging. And uh, I'm afraid that the digging continues, uh, at least for now. So uh, I'll, I'll stop with that. The thing is, I think many perfectly legitimate, intelligent people at news organizations understand what they're giving away. But yet, when faced with the fact that, when, when faced with a fear of irrelevancy, given the concentration of audiences, particularly younger audiences, who are going to be their, mm -hmm. their primary audiences, feel that they need to have a presence on Facebook and the others. How do you, how do you respond to that? I, I think the number one way to use social media is to uh, steer people back to things you control, if possible. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation. There is no precedent for Facebook. Uh, there's, there's never been anything like this where the conversation goes on with or without you. Uh, and, and I'm not big on government intervention uh, as a rule in, in most anything. Uh, I, I think this is becoming a monopoly that may require some attention from governments. And by the way, in many parts of the world, the way people think, people think the internet from these devices is Facebook. Uh, in the zero rating plans that uh, are now proliferating, Google participating in India, for example, uh, we, we have the, uh, quite a remarkable thing. I don't know, I don't want to tell people to stop going where the people are, uh, but I don't see a good outcome in handing stuff over. I just don't. Raju, I know you, News Corp has given a lot of thought to this and shares, as all news organizations, some of these concerns. How, what are the, some of the ways that you are addressing the issue of making sure about having a direct uh, relationship with your audience um, in light of the platforms? I think one of the first things we wanted to do and have tried to do is to kind of uh, make sure that we collect, protect, preserve, and then use the data that our audiences are very willingly giving us. And, 
that meant that you try to eliminate as much as possible third parties kind of harvesting that data. And um, uh, I'll give you a simple example, and I, we haven't done it yet, but it's worth thinking about, and it's not a news corp issue, right? All of us obviously want to have share buttons, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and hundreds of them these days, some of them. Um, but you can still provide that service to your reader without branding every page of your site with logos of every single platform by giving them free advertising, right? You could still do that. You could have a share folder in which you put all these kind of options. Or you could do it without the API that's constantly telling them how many people are kind of that meter that you run which says 40 people have clicked on this or 40 people have shared. That is giving live data in real time to all these platforms. So you could still serve your readers by having the share functionality without giving away a lot of the data. I think those are the kind of conversations that are not yet happening because I think a lot of publishers haven't yet come to grips with the idea that the data they already have is much more valuable than how they have treated it. So I think there is an element of using technology to kind of, um, kind of deal with data. If you step back, I think there's a larger issue. I think for up until very recently, our entire industry has really believed that having great, unique content is the competitive advantage that we have. But the problem in social media and the problem these days is that the advantage we have of compelling, unique, exclusive content has shrunk to minutes if we are lucky. Meaning that if I have a great story, the moment I publish it, literally within seconds, you'll start seeing others. If you're lucky, they will retweet you in the beginning. But very soon, they'll have their own tweets and they'll have their own rabbit holes and siphon of your audience. Right? So just relying on compelling content is no longer enough. I think newsrooms have to pivot from focusing on only creating content to creating compelling experiences. Because the experience is still very defensible, very proprietary, and even if others have the same content, the way you've given that experience is very, very defensible. And all good experiences or bad experiences really only come at the intersection of journalism and technology. And I think that's where the answer is. Sometimes the pendulum swings too far where somebody says, let's kind of create all of the technology because that's the experience we want to give, we want to control it. Mm -hmm. The challenge with that is kind of keeping up with it. To me, a lot of the resources are better spent at that intersection. If somebody has a really good CMS and you just need to tweak it, that's where you should put the resources. And then you should say, how do I create great experiences? How do I get the developers, the people to help the journalists kind of, kind of create that, rather than kind of building the pipes and building the infrastructure? So that's where I kind of disagree with some of the directions that media companies are taking. I agree with you, Vivian, that technology is what's going to kind of make a big difference. But just that how do you kind of invest in it and where do you invest in it, I think is critical. On the subject of experience, that, that allows us to bring the conversation back into the subject of how news organizations operate. We'll come back again to the, to the issue of the platforms. Um, I've just a, a, an experience from my own past. When I was at the New York Times, I was there at the moment where we decided to bring the developers into the newsroom. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, it may have been, it felt like it was a thousand years ago. It was maybe nine years ago. And the idea of moving the developers into the newsroom was a very uncomfortable proposition for on both sides. Because previously, um, and, and the New York Times is very early on digital, previously the journalists would come up with an idea, being print journalists, you know, the ideas were usually sort of print-centric, you know, imagined in their minds, projected onto a website, would go to the developers who were literally six blocks away in a different building and say, here, bil here build this. Well, as you might imagine, that did not create uh, the most optimal work. The moment you had the developers in the newsroom participating in conversations, participating in stories from the get-go, there was an incredible flowering of creativity that still continues at the New York Times and other news organizations that have those, um, those resources integrated today. On the other hand, it is not and continues to be not without cultural challenges. Mm -hmm. I think there is a, I have at least have experienced a, a sort of a deep discomfort on, for some legacy journalists because they don't, they, they know that they, they're not coders, they don't understand how the technology works, there's a certain dependence and that creates a discomfort. And that's sort of the beginning of some of the, the cultural issues having to do with the way perhaps technologists think and the way at least traditional journalists think. So I'd love to, with that long-winded <laughs> um, ramp up, I'd love to, to talk, maybe Jackie, I'll come back to you, 
Um, you know, you're working with, at, uh, you know, at BBC News, it's a very forward-thinking, innovative company, but you've also got people there who are very, very rooted in the way that they've done television news for a long time. So how are you, ex how are you seeing those cultural issues and breaking down concerns and barriers? Um, well, I think, uh, like, I, I was one, one of the developers that was brought into the newsroom at the New York Times as well that you were just speaking about. Um, and I think uh, it's through communication um, that you can break down some of the cultural challenges. Um, you mentioned that uh, more, I guess, maybe more traditional uh, journalists um, having uh, a discomfort around technologists. Um, it goes the other way as well. Um, it, it's it's not only a bit intimidating, no matter what uh, newsroom you're, you're entering as a technologist, de designer, or developer, um, to, to just work in the newsroom. Um, it's also, um, there's a whole lingo in newsrooms um, among journalists that um, I know I was stymied by many times. Um, but with conversation, um, collaboration on projects, that, that becomes even less so. Um, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of it for for me is more than just talking about what what's possible and uh, talking about uh, the ways that perhaps you know we can uh, do do our audience uh, or our readers uh, viewers a better service uh, through technology is by doing um, prototyping. I've had the most success, uh, of course, usually when you know involved early on in a story idea or line of, of reporting. Um, just um, being able to quickly prototype things uh, alongside reporters um, just to show, to demonstrate uh, what's possible. Um, th as an example, when I was at the Times, uh, we were doing uh, a long series of reporting on the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. Some of you might know that as Obamacare um, in the States. And we realized that we wanted to get as many perspectives as possible. We wanted to hear from doctors, um, we want to hear from health insurance people, and we want to hear from patients or would-be patients if they could have the insurance, but we couldn't be everywhere at once. And so um, I, I prototyped along with some other people on the interactive news desk a way of actually engaging directly with our readers. We didn't build a, you know, a prolific CMS for it. Uh, we just built a, you know, a, a interactive form, and they took various formats, some were gra more graphical than others. Um, and a way of storing all the information in a database so that people who wanted to actually contribute to our reporting could, and they did. And you know, once, once uh, the main um, health reporter on that story saw some of, the, some of her new lines of reporting just from hearing from our users, um, that kind of cleared the way for, for doing more uh, collaborations like that. Greg, you want to talk about the same issue at, at how the Washington Post approaches your, what you've experienced from cult, the cultural perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and here, I, here I can come back to, to my happy place, which is agreeing with Raju. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's where we found sort of the most um, uh, kind of uh, cultural synergy has been um, in projects where we're creating an experience. So um, our graphics team, I think, is you know, one of the best sets of storytellers that we have at The Post. Um, and what that group does is they, they'll often work with um, you know, folks who are reporting out a, a story in the traditional way, uh, but they're thinking about how they can, uh, how they can show that story, how, how, they can, um, how they can immerse users in that story. Um, we've had several uh, examples recently um, of that uh, where, you know, where I think that we've told the story really well. Um, there was, a, um, there was a, a, an investigation into uh, shaken baby syndrome and uh, some of the, the new research that's uh, emerged around that. Um, and we had some interactive elements that, uh, that explained you know, kind of what, you know, what it is and how that works and, and, and how the research has changed. Uh, we also had a, uh, a recent uh, um, project that was also uh, partially a video project. We have, uh, we've made an investment in, in video at the Post as well recently. Um, about, uh, it's called the N-Word Project, and it's about a, a particularly uh, virulent epithet in the United States. Um, uh, and it, it told the story in a very frank, um, but very accessible sort of way. Um, and it's that kind of reporting that, you know, really helps to drive a story home um, in a way that, um, that, that, you know, traditional print story couldn't necessarily, and in a way that, you know, as Raju was saying, could be, you know, kind of gobbled up by uh, social media in lots of different ways. So I think when things like that happen, it helps to break down the barriers that might exist um, <coughs> between, uh, between traditional journalists uh, and engineers. What's also interesting is that um, as, as time has gone on, 
Um, you know, we've hired more people who have been sort of double or triple threats in the sense that um, they are journalists and they also can code. Uh, Philip Bump, uh, who's one of our political reporters on a, a blog we have called The Fix, um, will often code his own uh, uh, interactives or uh, graphics um, that will explain sometimes, uh, sometimes rather hilariously, uh, uh, sometimes uh, just for uh, ex explanatory reasons, um, uh, bits of things that he's reporting in a traditional way. Um, so in, in that case, there, there, there is no communication problem. I, I'm, sure he's, I'm sure he's fine with that. Um, so yeah, th there's, I, I think, I mean, I just uh, back, uh, uh, piggybacking off of uh, one of the things Jackie said, I think the more that journalists and uh, technologists work together, uh, the better that collaboration can be. Danny wanted to add something. I, I want to emphasize that and, and also recall that this is not entirely a new thing. In the 19, late 80s and early 90s, I was doing what we then called computer-assisted reporting. I, uh, bizarre that we called it that. We, we never called it tele called telephone places. assisted reporting, but um, <laughs> where we'd, we'd make databases, we'd do, we'd do stories that were based on that. And, and the, the, yeah, there was a lot of uh, sort of what's this kind of thing from people. But when the stories started coming out, people said, oh, I get it. That's really interesting and useful. It took a while to catch on, but now we have this new thing that uh, we're, we're actual programming beyond uh, learning, uh, I don't know, D, D, uh, SQL or SAS or one of the statistical packages from the past. Now you need to know something a little more. And what I, I don't want all journalists to think they have to be programmers, but I do want all journalists to know how to have a conversation with programmers that is productive and that where the journalist has some clue what's going on with the programming. And there really are ways to do this. And we've done it with students. I've, I've in a thing I was doing uh, a few years ago, working with students to try and do their own startups, one of the things I made them do was take a, uh, uh, well, it wasn't an re absolute requirement, but I was strongly encouraged, was to go and <coughs> learn a bit of JavaScript uh, in addition to HTML. And JavaScript is becoming the way the web works. Mm -hmm. uh, we, if we give enough JavaScript, and it can, it's very simple, and there are free online courses that work brilliantly and you can do in your spare time, I would recommend to every journalist in this room and who would ever listen to learn a bit of that. You will have much more productive conversations with the people who actually write the code that runs the cool stuff that you're doing. And I, I think it'll work out better for everybody. Yes, sir. I think there are, like, having tried to do this uh, over the years, uh, the Washington Post and elsewhere, there are four or five lessons that seem still enduring, and I've spoken about this before, but it's worth reiterating. And I'll just list a few of them. Uh, credit matters. Mm -hmm. Most credit for great journalism usually goes to the editor, the reporter, and the photographer. A lot of the prizes go to them, a lot of the glory goes to them. I think increasingly news organizations are realizing that uh, if a substantial portion of a project has a lot of technology in it, mm -hmm. they are now nominating some of the people who used to be seen as back-end folks. Mm -hmm. So it really helps to kind of both <coughs> engage these technologists in newsrooms, keep them, and give them a sense of uh, pride. So it's a very simple thing, but it's often forgotten. So that makes a big difference. Titles matter. Most developers, when you first hire them, tend to come off as Ruby developer, Django developer, very, very kind of titles that nobody understands because they're rooted in their profession. And increasingly, smart newsrooms are relabeling some of them by calling them an interactive news designer. Mm -hmm. You're trying to give them titles that readers understand, and I think that kind of helps quite a bit as well for a group of technologists who are in our space, rather than kind of treat them as somehow these back-end specialist geeks that nobody understands. Vivian mentioned uh, about co-location. Co-location matters a lot, and a lot of people realize that even on a different floor makes a big difference in how collaborative it is. But co-location without changing the practices doesn't matter, meaning that a lot of journalists, especially your investigative projects team, tend to go far into the story before they even tell anybody where they are. And oftentimes, toward the very end, they turn to the developers and say, 
here's it almost done. Now what can you do to make it interactive, right? right. And I think you have to force a cultural change saying that you've got to involve them from the beginning and that makes a huge difference um, as well. Language matters a lot. If you talk to most journalists, they think the words they write, um, the photos that they, they take is art and everything else is stuff, right? And if you talk to developers, they think that the coding <laughs> is art and the words and the pictures and everything else is stuff. Right? So it's very hard to get them to because there's an equal sense of what is important. Mm. So if you switch the conversation to about what is the experience we want to give to our readers, then both of them kind of become on an even level and then they're both focusing on the experience as opposed to my words versus your software. But it, this has to be very consciously done uh, and makes a huge difference even though it seems um, very simple. And then this notion of insisting, especially if you're on the news side, that we need to do reusable templates. Right? There's a culture in our industry of like kind of everything being one-off and everything bespoke. It's very expensive. It's not a very good way to kind of leverage technology and trying to say that anything you build, if can we reuse it in a different context with a different piece of journalism, I think that's very critical, especially as we deal with um, uh, limited resources as well. So these are some of the things that I've found are actually kind of very, very practical and useful in kind of getting this collaboration going. I completely agree. And I'm actually going to be a panelist for a second here and say I'd add one, one more to those things too, which is organizational structure, mm -hmm. which in theory shouldn't matter who cares about your org chart, but I think it very much... Uh, I, I've seen it have a tremendous impact, at least for technologists in terms of them of feeling part of the journalistic process, that they're not sort of separate reporting up to some CTO. So my, my best, most recent example of that is I mentioned Vocative, uh, for, for whom I'm a, a, a strategic consultant. And Vocative has a group of, of sort of more traditional journalists. I mean, when I say traditional, I mean writers and, and, and videographers and, and, and you know, visualization folks in New York and then there is another group that some are in New York, but actually mostly in Israel, who are um, the, these analysts who use a proprietary technology to uncover content from the unsurfaced web, meaning um, content that can't be found via a search engine on message boards, publicly available content. So when I first started with them, those, those analysts who mostly come from a technology background were reporting up through part of the organization, through the CTO to a COO, and for the journalists, they were people on the other side of the organization, and the, and the analysts also felt like the journalists were some, some sort of these foreign, foreign group, literally and figuratively. Uh, but in understanding what the analysts did, and I remember being in a room with them, I said to them, you are journalists. You are doing the work of investigative journalism. You're finding things on the deep web that are source material for important reporting. And then we also did a reorganization and had the analysts be part of the newsroom. Mm -hmm. So even though you didn't have physical uh, uh, co-location, in fact, in this case, it's a seven hour time difference, just the mental shift from feeling, uh, c considering themselves as part of the journalistic effort mm -hmm. as journalists working with people that know how to you know, write, write stories and, and do the video made a world of difference and sort of everybody exhaled and felt like they were working together and it again led to some, a, a tremendous acceleration. So those, Though that organizational structure, I think, has an important impact. Um, I want to uh, take a, uh, go to questions. We're going to be ending, the, ending this um, panel actually a little bit earlier than is scheduled. We're going to end it quarter to five so that folks can get onto five o'clock panels all over town. So um, are there, uh, do we have microphones in the room? Do we have people with microphones in the room? Do we have questions is the more important question. Mm -hmm. Or do we have people with questions, I guess, before we <laughs> worry about the microphones? <laughs> okay. Was there a question over here? No? Oh, oh question, here question right here. Oh. Um, can I just ask, the, you talked a lot about the sort of um, workplace culture um, and the, the different sort of uh, bringing these, these two sides together, as it were. Um, but one of the things that's come up recently is the idea that having more technologists and technology is sort of making the line between editorial and commercial much harder to keep as clear blue water, which I don't think anyone has, has sort of said that that, that that should be closer. Could I just ask the panel what, what you think about, about that? I haven't, uh, I've come across a lot of reasons uh, for the church and state issues to be eroding, but I haven't heard of technology until recently. So this is an interesting one for me to think about. 
Um, where I think it's having some impact for us is that um, used to be that the CMS we would use for publishing would, would, be a, would not be useful for us to do native advertising of branded content that had to sit somewhere else. And increasingly, as those two come together in terms of where you publish it, we are finding that having so completely separate systems is causing a fair amount of like issues internally in being able to execute that. So th there I have seen some tech um, issues, but if you can give an example of what you mean, I think that might be more helpful because I haven't come across. Yeah, I would love to hear an example. Um, I was, there was two examples, one of which involves a, a British paper, The Telegraph, mm -hmm. um, which was accused of not running a story because of a big advertiser. And the, the feeling was that um, because of the way the web, um, we're all digital first, has, has enabled it to sort of not be labelled clearly, it was now much easier to do. Um, I'm not saying it's, it's a cause of technology, it's just it seems to be a sort of interesting phenomenon. Um, and then a very separate case, but about a global company, which is the Ferrari about BuzzFeed and, and what's been happening there recently. So those two cases, it just seems like quite an interesting area. Um, okay, that makes sense. I, I agree. Um, it's, I think it's a, a conversation that really needs to happen um, more. Um, it involves, you, you mentioned things that involve so many issues. There's um, the issue of um, privacy, right, um, with, uh, whether it's um, BuzzFeed using its quizzes or um, other analytics to uh, track uh, audience engagement. Um, or it's also about, uh, with the Telegraph example, I think it's more of an issue of journalistic integrity, right? And, and um, maybe uh, like kind of a watchdog um, aspect, um, giving um, the readers or citizens um, more um, uh, I don't know how you would say it, like um, just having having the ability just through um, being able to search on, on the website to find some of the older stories that m might have existed before and perhaps no longer are there. Um, so I think it's, I think that's a conversation that uh, we need to be having more um, around privacy and around, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the conversation exactly would be with the Telegraph. Um, I'm not seeing it as a technology issue as much mm -hmm. as uh, just not enforcing um, your normal kind of standards. In, uh, up until four, five, six years ago, um, it used to be that the web team was very separate. The print and those guys, was, oftentimes the web teams were non-union, very cheap. Mm -hmm. So there was this sense that they can get away with some things. And I think sometimes some things would slip past that, but again, the, less of a technology issue and more where organizations were very separate. Uh, but these days, I don't think that's an excuse anymore. I think Ben Smith, uh, BuzzFeed said that he just screwed up, and which I think he did. And uh, Telegraph, uh, Jason Seiken is gone, partly because of the HSBC and other issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at that as a good sign of acknowledging that they were just normal ethical issues as opposed to technology driving it. I'm saying that not knowing the actual facts of either one of those. Of course, there, all of these issues become exacerbated because they are spread in an instant. Right, right. So uh, well, there, there, there is a, a technology angle. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think I think the technology issue that may go directly to your question is the is data, yeah. uh, and that's been coming on for a long time. We didn't used to know uh, in print what, who who was reading what, yeah. and who we sort of knew who they were, but we didn't know much beyond that. And now we know a lot, and that is plainly having influence uh, over journalism and content in a larger sense, but clickbait was not invented after uh, the internet. Uh, clickbait has existed in the form of tabloids mm -hmm. for a long time. It's the equivalent, and, and it's just we're, we're better at it now. And, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, it, I, my, my, my cure for a lot of these things is transparency. I don't see enough of it, but I think that with an, if we had a lot more that these very important ethical questions would be more easily understood and uh, possibly resolved. Next question. All the way in the back. Oh. Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Ingram. Anybody have an extra Fortune laptop? Magazine. For I'm, I'm not on the panel. I'm not on the panel. I'm nobody. Um, this is, I guess, mostly for Dan, but but for anyone else who wants to answer. So, given that media companies essentially have to deal with Facebook, it exists. It's huge. You can reach a big audience. It's it can do a lot of favors for you. But it, uh, there's also a risk. How should media companies deal with that problem? If you have to, you can't say no, you can't not deal with them. So how do you approach it? it, it well, when, when I become the, uh, the czar of all media, <laughs> uh, I, I will organize uh, every content company of every kind uh, to do two things. One is to create a, uh, a, a re-decentralized uh, federated version of social networks that no one actually owns but that works in a very distributed way. And secondly, uh, I, I will, uh, on behalf of all content providers, uh, cut a deal with Facebook that doesn't give away the store to Facebook and that gets something back from them that is uh, at least of equal value to what they're getting from us. But since we, uh, one thing we know about journalists is that they don't, they don't collaborate very well, uh, and there are antitrust issues that would be raised by something of that or of that sort uh, that would not be trivial. But I'd like to see the industry at least start having these conversations uh, about, you know, where is it going to live? when it no longer controls the uh, 21st century printing presses or the methods of delivery. What, what's the future at that point? And I don't see an organized effort on the part of the industry to do that. Anybody else want to take that one? Um, <laughs> I don't have an answer yet, but um, I think it, it's rooted in the belief that um, Facebook perhaps needs Wall Street Journal content as much as we need Facebook. And we believe in our content and our experiences. And up until now, we've been, you know, Facebook has been around for a while and we've been very happy to kind of use them and vice versa. Uh, I just don't think that giving full text stories, giving away all your audience data um, is anything other than mortgaging your future. <coughs> The journal may be one of the very few properties that can mm. do this. Washington Post? No? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would say, you know, kind of responding directly to your question, you know, how, how should uh, news organizations approach Facebook? Um, directly with eyes wide open and not motivated by fear. Um, I think that, you know, understanding what we can provide to Facebook, I mean, I think Raju's exactly right. I mean, uh, what we can provide to Facebook and what Facebook can provide to us, and then, uh, and then keeping our, our eyes open as that happens. Um, and ensuring that um, you know what happens is as good for us as it is for Facebook, and that it's a that it's a valued you know it remains a valuable partnership for everyone. Um, but yeah, I mean just you know simply kind of you know giving away um, our, our data because um, that you know sort of helps us achieve a short-term goal is necessarily short-sighted. So oh, there, there's a very practical issue that brings us brings this conversation back to the topic, right? Which is that one of the key arguments Facebook is making is that the speed with which they can deliver your stories to their audience is significantly better if you give them full text versus the whole links business. Mm -hmm. And honestly, they're right, they're right, right? And that stems from the fact that 17, 18 years of websites or 20 years or whatever, we've done such a horrible job of our news website, right? They still take five, six, seven seconds to load in some cases. Mm -hmm. And we've not invested where the user experience and the speed and all of that matters. And so we are now at the mercy of somebody who says that uh, you know we are faster and that's a better experience because you can't contest that that part of it. Mm -hmm. Again, goes to show that technology and investment should have been made in those spaces and that were not made and now we are suffering from it. I, I, on, on as far as the post goes, when when you combine the Washington Post and Facebook, here's what you get: Facebook. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna play devil's advocate here and say there is there is are some businesses one in particular BuzzFeed which is their business model sure. is becoming more and more based on distributed content they don't they don't care I mean Jonah Peretti just did a big speech about this most recently right. 
He doesn't care, and his monetization model is built on the fact that he doesn't care whether you come back to BuzzFeed.com or BuzzFeed's app because they are distributing branded content and they make money off of the visibility regardless of where it's seen. I just think it needs to be said. And they can uniquely do that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There are also counterexamples even in the short term. I mean, when is the last time you guys have heard of Upworthy again? Right? Right. Two years ago, they were all the rage. All of it was because of Facebook and they've just dropped off the cliff. I mean, they may still have a lot of page views and all of that, but right. again, I think you do put yourself, your business model at somebody else's mercy. Yeah. BuzzFeed has a very different model than most of us up here who are advertising based, and it's a very different approach. Yeah, I mean, Facebook giveth, Facebook taketh away, right? So yeah. it's, again, just just going in, uh, knowing what your goals are, and ensuring as, as we move forward that those, those goals are met. Next question. I know some of you may be eager to get to the Facebook session, right, which is true. happening after this one. And I might point out it's in a church, which I think sort of <laughs> speaks volumes. <laughs> if that is the case, then, I mean, technology versus journalism, yeah. now we really know, right? <laughs> exactly. Any other questions? Any closing thoughts uh, from our panelists before we wrap up? Um, since 1450, Gutenberg Press, not a single newspaper publisher has created a better printing press of their own to kind of somehow win this battle. I'm not sure why we don't le learn lessons from history and stop worrying about creating better CMSs. <laughs> and over <laughs> <laughs> Oh, are you going to, are you letting no, me go? I'm not, I'm not oh. looking at you. Oh. I mean, you, if it, you collect your thoughts there, Jack Yoga. But if you're going to throw Gutenberg at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah but one, one final thought for me is that um, in addition to, um, like, you mentioned uh, that, you know, we haven't spent a lot of time optimizing our, our websites for, like, how long they load. I think on top of that, we need to think more about how, how to surface um, the stuff that we put out, um, not just day to, like on a day-to-day -day or breaking news basis, but also um, in our archives. Like I think media organizations are starting to, but really have to do a lot more to get structured data. Um, you know, like what, like what the topics, what the key um, people being written about or um, portrayed in video are, um, so that we can do a better job of providing context in the future. I guess I'll, I'll say yes, go, go at this with eyes wide open, um, but it, it seems to me like people are going over the wall in World War I with their eyes wide open and getting slaughtered. Uh, I, 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 want to <clears throat> I want to see the news, people who do news start working together a lot harder and uh, finding a way to counter uh, all of these threats to fundamentally their, their existence uh, because I think it's kind of important that we have independent journalism and uh, I see some real threats to it. I'll leave you with something more, uh, more uplifting than, mm. uh, than World War I, uh, <laughs> which is, um, you know, I, I, the printing press hasn't changed very much, much since Gutenberg, but newspapers certainly have. Um, and newspapers have evolved tremendously over even the past 50 years, the past 20 years. Um, you know, narrative storytelling is something that's a relatively uh, new invention when it, when it comes to, uh, to newspapers and especially the way that we present it. Um, so changing with the times even before digital was, uh, uh, was a thing, uh, uh, was a gleam in Al Gore's eye, um, it, it was, uh, news has, con consistently been evolving. Um, you know, uh, print be begat radio, which begat television, which begat, you know, so there, there, there have been all of these new and different things that, uh, that we as news publishers uh, have had to grapple with, and this is just the latest one. Um, I think resourcefulness, um, I think uh, confidence, um, I, I think that just understanding that this, this, this too shall be something we'll learn from, um, and, and, and I think that Having a strategy that's not necessarily one note, um, you know, looking at technology, yes, but also investing in journalism um, and trying to bring those two things together so that you're, you're not spending all of your time and all of your money doing one, but you're making uh, really targeted bets 
across the board um, so that you can, you can be the best news organization in the <coughs> digital world that you can be. Okay, well, we'll end on that positive note. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience. <laughs>